Explicitycast from Explicity. When the ambulance arrived, it turned out to be an old Maruti van that had been repurposed for the task. It had a crew of one, the driver and no accompanying paramedics. I glanced at the back. There was no stretcher, just a hard, flat, grey slab of a worn-out seat. My eye travelled to an oxygen cylinder on the floor. Does it work? I asked the driver. He assured me it did. Then he suddenly asked me if we could provide the mask for the oxygen. Suspicious of the infrastructure, I told him we would not travel with him if he was not fully equipped with a kit to administer oxygen. He suddenly produced a mask and guaranteed me that everything was in order. By now, caught between panic and fear, I decided to take the chance and not lose more time. We helped our father onto the back. I sat in the front seat with the driver. Along the way, we encountered random police check posts every few kilometers, set up to enforce the city's lockdown. They perilously slowed down a stream of ambulances, leading to a traffic snarl that could have made the difference between life and death. The driver had no idea of how to get to Medanta, and so I had one eye on Google Maps, another on my father at the back. Is he breathing? I repeatedly asked his nurse. Over the noise of the traffic in the rickety vehicle we were in, my father motioned his hand at me in a wave, as if to say, everything will be all right. But by the time we reached the Medanta ICU, my father's oxygen levels after an hour of being on a cylinder had plummeted. The young doctor on the emergency shift told me that the mask fixed to the cylinder had not administered high flow oxygen as it ought to have. And my father was it no longer in any condition to be admitted to a general room as we had promised him. He needed to go straight to the ICU and naturally there was no bed free immediately. My father was extricated from that sham of an ambulance, placed in a wheelchair, wheeled into the open lobby of the hospital and now given a different oxygen cylinder. I stroked his hair and I hugged him. He was barely conscious or cognizant now of his surroundings. He had aged 10 years in that hour. He sat hunched over, his hands limp, his face impassive. Even in that horrific moment when my heart was quite literally in my throat, I knew that my upper class privilege, my relative access to monetary and other resources, made my father luckier than many Indians. After all, this is what I had spent months and months doing, telling the stories of those who were dying at the gates of hospitals, sometimes on the streets because the healthcare system had crumbled. Now, I was on the other side. I was the protagonist instead of the chronicler. It was surreal but also debilitating. I was so much more used to asking the questions, offering empathy, reflecting the rage. Suddenly, as a protagonist of my own sadness, I did not know how to cope. That day was the last day I would see my father alive. As we rebuild ourselves from the debris of COVID, we would have learned nothing if our hearts and minds are not moved by the staggering injustice of all that we saw. In many ways, COVID the contagion is about the mystery, but also about the eventual miracle of science. But if one were to ask me, COVID above all should be about a resetting of conscience, priorities and emotion as a nation and as individuals. The tryst with COVID is about us, we the people, the humans of this pandemic, the flesh and blood and tears and laughter that the data will never capture. In these strange times, so many of us have regressed into memories from our early years, looking for comfort in old familiars. As I think of all the things I should have said to my father while he was still alive, I'm haunted by the harm of one of my favorite tunes, a song from the Muppet movie, a childhood staple that suddenly seems to have new meaning about hope and optimism in a midlife sullied by sorrow. When the government exempted the media from the lockdown, logically it was to ensure that the media could do its job, which was to bring information and news to the people who were sequestered in their homes. My guest today did just that. She is Barkha Dutt, one of India's best-known journalists. Barkha decided that she was going to bring information to the people, but true to her wont, she didn't do this by halves. She stepped out and travelled across the country with a small team of colleagues. Over a time of about three months, she, with her team, logged over 30,000 kilometres. 
that's a share under 19,000 miles, traveling over surface in every available transport. A tragedy like the COVID pandemic brings out the best and the worst in people. And Barka was witness to it all. Appropriately, her book is titled Humans of COVID. Everywhere she went, she logged the stories of the worst off among us. These stories are deeply human and capture the essence of how we cope when nature turns against us. The medical fraternity cared for the living. Barka met people who cared for the dead. People who put their own religions behind them and even temporarily adopted the faith of those who needed to be cremated or buried. They gave the dead the dignity that the pandemic had taken from them. At one point, this journey turned deeply personal for Barka. She lost her father to COVID. But she soldiered on and the result is this compelling book, a historical account, oral histories of the most disadvantaged, their grief, sometimes their hubris, often their humanity. As a journalist, Barka has covered some of the biggest stories in the nation. Of the many, she mentions that her eventful career was bookended by the war in Cargill in 1999 and the COVID crisis in 2020-2021. In what used to be a staid and almost pedagogic profession, as journalism used to be in India, Barkha was one of the new breed of TV journalists, young, aggressive, with an eye on one prize and one prize alone, the story. I had the privilege to host a live session with Barka at the recent Bangalore Literature Festival, and now doubly my privilege to welcome her as my guest today. Barka Dutt, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you for having me. We had a wonderful session at the Bangalore Lit Fest, didn't we? Absolutely. I wish we had more time, but I'm sure we can make up for that in this conversation. Once more, with feeling? Absolutely. Cool. Let's get started. Now, this show is called The Literary City because it focuses on the literature end of the business. I've always admired TV reporters who have only a little time to say a little bit, but say so much. How do you get so pithy? And was writing a book different? You know, as somebody who's been a visual storyteller pretty much all my adult life, when it actually comes down to writing a book, I actually find that I have to unlearn some of my training. Because my training teaches me to write for pictures. You know, I always give this example of this time when I was reporting on the tsunami in in southern India. Right. And um, my camera caught this image of a clock um, that was floating in in, in the water of a home that had been ravaged uh, by the tsunami. Mm -hmm. And the needles of the clock had uh, stood still. Right. And the image was very powerful and it was the opening image of my report. Hmm. But because I was in a visual medium, uh, my script went something as follows. It said time stood still in this home in Nagapatina. Compelling. But if I were to recreate this moment for a book, I would have to describe the water, the clock, the color of the clock, um, you know, recreate the tactile uh, sort of experience that an image can automatically convey. Right. So actually, while maybe you're right, that 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 some sense of writing in short sentences has come from being a broadcast uh, a journalist. Uh, some things you have to consciously not do. You can't count on the visuals to tell the story. You have to recreate it and Therefore, I think a lot of my writing is very visual. I I think I'm trained to think in visuals. And so even when I write a book, I'm always trying to paint a kind of visual picture for the reader. Right. And brevity becomes the craft, especially so when you are standing in front of a camera with a deadline and you're not always scripted. You know, CNN was credited with having brought the Gulf War I into people's living rooms. When cable TV news started in India, we were all witness to this new style of aggressive, gonzo journalism, and you were a part of that. Were you aware that you were a part of that? <laughs> I don't know if we saw ourselves like that. Um, I mean, you know, I I just remember being um, manically kind of passionate about what I did or what I was getting a chance to do. I saw it as actually a, a kind of privilege mm-hmm. you know I, I i saw the opportunity to tell the stories of my country of our time how as a as an opportunity that i was lucky to have okay and you know therefore i i, I perennially felt 
just thrilled that I could be uh, in a way at the front line of, uh, of, of, of telling some of the most sort of compelling stories of our time. And I don't know if we ever saw ourselves as either brash or gonzo. I think what we did see ourselves as um, is being driven and fueled by complete passion. It was a pure play passion project. And um, and I think that kind of made a difference to how we approach journalism, which today is mainstream. When we did this, this was an alternative. It is visual storytelling was very, very new to India. It only started television, came private television news came to India in the 1990s. And, and, and you know, the fact is that as a first generation broadcast journalist, we had, I had no idea what any of this was going to be like. So in other words, I didn't join this because this was well-paying or because this was going to get my mug on camera. I just, you know, or because it was a conformist kind of safe profession, safe career path. It was oh, it was the opposite in every possible way. It was the great unknown. It was not particularly well-paying. Um, none of us were especially trained. I went to, to, you know, I was trained. I was a rare person in that I had trained in film and television production. But most of my peers had come straight from newspapers. Um, and I w- only went to journalism school two years after I started working, you know, when I went to Columbia. And, um, and I was still a unique uh, sort of creature in that in the in the way that most people, as I said, were exports from newspapers, from newspaper newsrooms. Right. So so really, it was a great unknown. And I think the kind of people it drew possibly was somewhat different from the kind of people that it tends to draw today when it is a much more mainstream professional choice. Right. But I dare say it had its rewards. Now, I know that TV scripting and writing is not the same as print journalism, where even on a deadline, you have enough room to write some compelling or flowery prose. Not much room for literary niceties in uh, TV reportage, except this once, when you said you were moved to tears by the Shakespearean Kalpanath Rai as he was being carted off to prison. Let me quote this from your book. As he spouted his own version of Shakespeare on justice and the quality of mercy, I burst into tears. Please tell me you weren't moved by his newfound piety. (laughs) Well, he certainly thought I was. (laughs) Uh, But for the benefit of your your listeners, uh, this was many, more than a couple of decades ago. And Kalpanath Rai was a very, very controversial political figure accused of links with with the underworld being tried in a local court in Delhi. And, you know, his sentencing, I had gone to report uh, his his sentencing, basically how many years he was going to spend in jail. And I had been tasked with the assignment of trying to get an interview with him. And uh, there was a lot of media interest in this story. He was a prominent uh, political figure at the time. And the police, there was there was sort of more police than there were reporters. And the police had sort of cordoned us off behind like a, a rope and told us to stay behind uh, that rope and not move forward. Uh, but we could see from where we were standing, this man being brought down a ramp from the rear side of the court where he had just been sentenced. And um, I said, I must try and take my chance. Uh, so I, I thought I'm going to make a dash for it. So I kind of slid under the rope with my camera person and we made a dash, like kind of hot footing it to this ramp, which was at a height above us. And I had to jump on this sort of ledge and this parapet and kind of hold my mic to him, hoping to catch a bit of his audio as he was walking down the ramp. And as I ran, the other uh, journalists also ran. So there was this kind of media scrum running towards Kalpanath Rai. And suddenly, as Kalpanath Rai started quoting Shakespeare, um, there were tears streaming down my face. And he actually thought I was very moved. But actually, simultaneously, uh, there was a monkey nipping me. Uh, I had, 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 had basically mm-hmm. had, <laughs> had his teeth sunk into my ankle uh, because one foot of mine was hanging in the air. This poor wild monkey had obviously been scared by this rush of journalists. This was his natural habitat, uh, the court. And so it was hilarious, but I can't tell you, it did not feel hilarious at the time. It was very acutely painful. I had six rabies injections. Uh, but it's, but it kind of set the tone for what I was telling you, that, you know, we, we cared so much about the story, like, you know, just getting what we'd been asked to do. Um, and and, and there, there are things that maybe, I, you know, there are many things I would still do just the same way. Maybe today I wouldn't go running after, you know, a, a politician with a monkey at my ankle. But that's <laughs> just a slight sort of advent of middle age. But I would pretty much do the same 
the impulses are the same. Right. You know, the thing to do it out of passion, that impulse is the same. Absolutely. And that monkey had no respect for Darwin. <laughs> now, you've had quite the career. And uh, in your words, you were bookended by Cargill on the one side and the COVID crisis on the other. Now, Cargill, now you were right there in the middle of the action. How did you get this gig? Well, uh, I, I was able to go to Cargill well after, uh, in a way, the war had begun. Because before that, uh, we were kind of the only access to what was happening in the high reaches of the mountains was daily press briefings in Delhi. But Kargil, uh, as a woman, I had a really difficult time first convincing uh, my organization, then NDTV, uh, and then the military to allow me as a woman to report from the front line. Uh, the military was very much all male then at, at the front line. Today, we have many with more women in critical roles, um, including flying fighter jets and so on. But this was a very, very all male terrain that we were talking about. The military felt that, so in that way, it was different from being embedded. There was no formal uh, embedding. Uh, you know, embedding allows a certain structure uh, to what you're, you know, to what you do in a day. Uh, and this, and it's, it's, you know, this was not, not formal. In fact, one of the things that they said while giving us conditional uh, permission to go into the war zone was that, look, we can't look after you. We can't look after you. You're on your own. And if you're willing to come there and be on your own, then okay, but don't expect us to provide food, a place to stay, a bathroom. And that's why they were very exercised that as a woman, where, what, where would I go? What would I do? And I kind of thought I had never experienced war uh, before or even reported an insurgency. This was my first such exposure. I said, no, no, I completely get it. And I will, you know, do just what the what, what my male colleagues do, uh, whether it's, you know, taking a leak out under a tree or in an open field, sleeping wherever you find space, which as it turned out was sometimes at the back seat of a car, sometimes it was under an open sky, sometimes it was in an underground bunker. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I was able to get, see, so you have to understand the war was obviously unfolding uh, uh, up on the mountain peaks where Pakistani intruders had taken Indian territory and Indian soldiers were moving up the flanks to, 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 to push these uh, sort of intruders out and back and reclaim our land. That was the context. Now, obviously, we had no access on those mountain peaks. But what we, a small group of us, four of us, in fact, me, my camera person, and two other colleagues who were from the printed uh, medium, we made a small group and we would travel up and down the highway that connected uh, Leh to Srinagar. And what this allowed us to do was to give us, it gave us a kind of vantage point uh, because we couldn't go up the mountains ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But the mountain peaks overlook this highway. And because they overlook this highway, a lot of the actual military action, which basically means that our guns or our rocket launchers that were uh, firing at the peaks at which the intruders had captured territory or provided covering fire to our soldiers as they walked up, a lot of them were stationed you know, along the stretch of the highway. And then the Pakistanis army would fire back right, to protect their um, their men. And so... So the Pakistanis were firing on the highway on which you were traveling, right? Yes, this is the highway from... So this, is, this was the only way to actually get access to the war zone in a visual... You could, you could see this on your camera, right? You could see... You could see the counter uh, attack by the Pakistanis. You could see... Um, our sort of military hardware going for these peaks, right? Uh, I remember the first time I heard the sound of a Bofors gun go on behind me. I jumped. I like, it's on camera. I jumped because they don't take tools. And although this none of this was live, you know, there's some completely misplaced notion that any of this reporting was live. Uh, we had no satellite vans up there. Uh, this was pre, pre-tech almost. Um, mobile phones were... Uh, blocked in Jammu and Kashmir for security reasons. So there was no phone uh, access. There was no live broadcasting. And you would record, we still filmed on tape, and then there would be the question of how do you get these tapes back to your newsroom? Right. And so we would walk, sometimes drive. At one point, our, our driver ran away because there was so much bombing from the Pakistani side that the car 
that he was driving got shelled. And so he just said he'd had enough and he went back. So we then would walk little stretches and just, you know, rest where we could. And we would then request our chopper pilots who were carrying the coffins of our soldiers back to the cities that could you, sir, please take our tapes. And this is how we would ferry information and tapes back. So this is, this is how we got access. So, it, you know, today it's a much more, uh, today the military would have a plan if they wanted to embed you. But this was something that neither the military nor us, my mother had reported a war in 65 uh, between India and Pakistan um, as, a, as a, again, a, as a solitary reporter, she worked with Hindustan Times, but no one had ever actually dealt with television cameras or, you know, cameras at the front line. And, and, we were making, like, you know, we were finding our way as the war went along. It was a new territory for both us and the military. And the military had no time to think about us, obviously. Sure. They had to think about about the war. Right. So, yeah, that was Kargit. I remember that news clip when you were, when you were recoiled, no pun intended, from the Beaufort's gun when it was fired, from that sound. Now, some of my friends who had covered both the Gulf Wars tell me as war correspondents that the actual sound of being there in the middle of war is very different from the movies. And they said that that noise kept them from being able to articulate thoughts even to themselves. Not because it wasn't dramatic enough, but because it was too dramatic. Did you too feel any of this? Yeah, that's very that's very well said. I always feel that when something's actually larger than life, actually the w- words and pictures both fall short. And we try, we try at writing, we try through visuals, but articulation is a problem because you're capturing something enormous and you're capturing something enormous in real time. Mm-hmm. And what about the human experiences? So th- there were these group of young soldiers who saved our lives and they allowed us to stay with them in an under- underground bunker. And then it was just pure coincidence that they got orders uh, to go up the mountain the next morning. And we were all very torn up because these were men. We just met them, but they saved our lives. And we felt in that moment, like, you know, we felt very intimately connected to them. Mm. And we didn't know if we, we were ever going to see them again. And right. I, I asked one of them, I was very interested in understanding uh, the relationship between courage and vulnerability. And so I would repeatedly talk to a lot of these young men were in their early 20s about this. And so I asked this one captain, uh, I said, you, aren't, you, aren't you scared? Like, what are you thinking right now? And he said, you know, I can see my entire life flashing before me like a short film. And I found this so momentous because I was there with him in that bunker and I knew he may never come back alive again. And But yet when it came to reporting this, and I reported it, and, you know, his interview was on camera, I still felt it didn't capture the courage of this 23 year old you know he's in a sense feeling proud but yet there's an element of fear and he's at a very young age life has made him confront things that that are enormous that are gigantic and and you know how do I recreate something like that how do I capture that that moment which has courage and vulnerability and 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 and, you know there's a Hindi word zinda dil which is sort of you know, the large heartedness of a, of a, of a military culture. It's, it's a very generous, big hearted yes. sort of culture. And, and, and I don't know that words and pictures can capture it. I don't know. Well, eventually you did bring it home to people. What was the challenge? My challenge was actually, what, what if I was not cogent? What do I need to make this a cogent account? Am I conveying it correctly? Uh, am I conveying it sensitively? Um, the challenges are about humanizing. I care very much about that. And so for me, those are the challenges. And how do you do all of this and still be cogent and still make it out in one piece? And from those intensely visual experiences, your reportage on COVID resulted in a book. Yeah. How was writing a book different? So I think that you write a book because you know that certain things need distance, right? Um, Interesting. A book is just the opposite. A book needs you to step back and give it more form, give it more perspective, give it more context. And a book is also written to prepare, uh, without sounding lofty about it, uh, to draft of history. Yes, I agree. I remember telling my editor, publisher, Chiki Sarkar, even if not one person reads this book, I need to write it. 
because there will be a time when we'll be ready to read this book. Uh, you know, even now when I go into events around my book, I can see the hesitation in people because it's it's like people don't want to remember what they've just come through. And they worry about feeling sad after reading my book or they worry about reliving something they've gone through. And I always say to them that, you know, one thing I learned is that you can't put a lid on your memory because it'll come back to bite you, haunt you, keep you up at night. We have to acknowledge what we've lived or cha- being changed by or not being changed by. Something happened these two years to all of us in different ways. What a lovely phrase you just used. You can't put a lid on your memory. Your book is full of pity, homilies, uh, where did you learn to write like that? <laughs> I struggle with writing. I'm laughing because I I really struggle. And I struggled with this book. Uh, I struggled with this book not because of the craft. I struggled with this book because of my emotional dysfunction. Uh, by the time I got down to writing it, it was the end of 2021. And um, I had not coped with my father's uh, loss, uh, nor had I coped with um, actually the extent of you know, death and despair and the number of bodies I had seen and the number of graveyards and hospitals and crematoriums I had been to. And of course, there were also moments of hope and human upliftment in all of this. And I, I write about those in my book, but there was a lot of sorrow, personal and, 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 and community sorrow. And I had not dealt with any of it because, and this happened to me in Cargill also. Like I remember in Cargill, especially being conscious of being female at the front line, I did not allow myself tears. But I remember when the war was over, for many months afterwards, I couldn't sleep and I would wake up at night just sobbing. In COVID, it was, Cargill was, you know, 15 days at the war front and a few months and the war had ended. COVID went on, like in my life, professional life and personal life for two years, um, you know, with some gaps in between. And By the time I sat down to write this book, I suddenly had to confront waves of emotion that I had just literally put the lid on, as as I said. And I, at one point, called up Chiki and I said, I can't do the book. And that's what she reminded me that she said, you you had said that even if nobody reads this book, this book has to be written. Right. And now to the craft. Now to the craft. Uh, You know, I I find that actually being a, a... and to that extent, to being a visual storyteller has helped me because in good writing for visuals necessarily means short sentences. You can't write long, present, continuous sentences. And I used to write like that uh, till I was taught both in journalism school and just on the job. You, you realize that you have to write in clauses. You have to write in idioms. You have to write in phrases. You can't write long sentences, nor is it my skill. There are people who who do a fantastic opening lead and it's a really long sentence and they know that craft. That's not my craft. I, I, I don't seek to be profound. I don't seek to have sparkling original prose. I am a reporter. I write like a reporter. And honestly, I don't see how that's a bad thing necessarily because your book combines hard-hitting reportage with feelings that are deeply sensitive. For example, Barka, for all the stories of uh, greed and callousness and bureaucratic apathy, you also have the stories of how people have risen to help each other, uh, as they often do during a crisis, don't they? Yes. I mean, I think that, you know, there is a lot of, I mean, our headlines are always filled with the stories of strife. Uh, but, you know, we should make space for um, the amity and the essential Humanism, that is the word I'd use, and the generosity of the human spirit, right? Which is able to find room for strangers even in the midst of very difficult times uh, that, that a family may be going through or an individual may be going through. And I I do feel that in some strange ways, COVID, though bleak as it was, it, it gave me hope that there's still an essential goodness in people. There is still um, There's still an essential humanity uh and you know if we were to step back from the noise uh noisy mediated experience of media maybe we would feel something experience something different now, i'm going to come out and say it i think that this is a beautifully crafted book thank you i thank you thank you thank now, you so in, much in in the beginning uh of this episode uh, the part that you read was the uh, concluding part of uh, of your book it was a tone of optimism is that how you feel right now? Optimistic about everything? Uh, to be honest, I feel very emotionally tired of the couple of last few years that I've lived. Um, 
but i do at the same time maybe want to hold on right uh to the parts that give me that optimism i won't say i'm optimistic i would say there's enough to draw optimistic energy from it's a work in progress and i think we all need to do that because it is cataclysmic and you know we want to pretend that this you know couple of years didn't happen in our lives but it did it's changed so many things fundamentally right mm-hmm. and i think that while we learn our sort of collective and individual lessons from it we should hold on to the better part of ourselves that we saw in these two years that's wonderfully said wonderful sentiment so where are you headed with the sentiment well i moved out of television to becoming a digital entrepreneur uh, towards the end of 2019 is when i launched my platform it's called mojo story uh, it's called that for a reason uh, i wanted to discover or rediscover my mojo and i felt like i had lost that somewhere in terms of why i had become a journalist and also that whenever i would go people would tell me that they didn't see their lives or what mattered to them reflected uh, in 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 media and so we uh, you know we're video first so i remain above everything a visual storyteller but uh, we also have a tagline of being people first because i felt that one of the mistakes that i had made myself and that others may also be making is how far you move away from things that matter to people and uh, you know in 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 the news media there's a danger of doing journalism for other journalists oh yes and so i think i just sort of want to recommit myself to the idea of journalism that excited me when i was you know getting my ankle bitten by that monkey <laughs> which is really about being driven by passion and not by the approval of you know others in your echo chamber right um so i'm hoping uh, to go forward in that direction further we've had um reasonably successful couple of years professionally and we hope to build on that well more power to your elbow and as far as no one reading your book is concerned if the lines at the banglo lit fest for your book signing were anything to go by <laughs> all that would be a bit of a past tense wouldn't it yes i'm very glad i ho- i'm glad i wrote it i'm glad i went through the emotional turmoil and did write it and on that happy note barka dat thank you so much for being my guest today on the literary city thank you for having me ramji and thank you for the conversation both here and at the lit fest entirely my pleasure and that was the wonderful barka dat and i'll be back with what's that word that fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about right after this I'm back. It's time for what's that word and for my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. We've had a busy week, P with an A. Yes, we have. And barely distinguishable from any other week. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Say back to back interviews with Barkadat. both terrific right thank you both very enjoyable and both so different in mm. context you right. clearly enjoyed her book well books you know i hadn't read her previous book before i prepped to interview her uh this unquiet land and the other like her next book covid as will you yeah i always end up reading whatever author we feature here on the literary city yes i did notice this rather upwardly erudite manner in you of late <laughs> <laughs> hey but actually why not mm-hmm. that's what we're here to do oh, oh i'm simply having fun as am i but we are slave to the deadline aren't we uh, but deadlines are what make it fun okay p with an a what's that word <laughs> deadline <laughs> it came up so often in your interview with barkadat okay cool uh, <laughs> let's get what we know about the word deadline out of the way first go okay so a deadline is a date and time by which something must be done right you know and unless you want your boss to shout at you <laughs> but there's nothing in the words dead mm-hmm. and line mm-hmm. that suggest a goal for task completion is there yeah Well you're right which is why the origin of this word is so interesting. Oh goody. Okay, roll the tape please. <laughs> All right. First, 
The word has a rather macabre and uh, and bloody history. Ooh, blood and gore. <laughs> Etymology is so much like an action thriller movie. <laughs> Mixed metaphors, <laughs> sentences ending in prepositions, transferred epithets. Netflix, in fact, is planning a limited series about a murderous etymologist. You know, <laughs> he he stabs people with his quill dipped in poisonous ink. <laughs> You know, he's otherwise a mild-mannered milk toast of a man. Very, very grammatical, though. No one suspected him. <laughs> Tell me about his deadline. Okay, as I said, the word has a horrible origin. So it goes back to a gentleman named Heinrich, or Henry, Wurtz. He was expelled from his native Switzerland. He found his way to the U.S. He got married, moved to Louisiana, enlisted in the army as a private and fought the Civil War in 1861. He was fighting for the bad guys. All right. In the Battle of Seven Pines, as it was called, in 1862, he was really badly wounded and he lost the use of his right arm. But he returned to the army as a hero, and he was put in charge of a prisoner of war camp, a POW camp, called Camp Sumter. When the war ended in 1865, however, he was arrested. Why? Well, hundreds of people had testified to his atrocities while he was in charge, you know, not giving them proper rations or food. But the worst atrocity of them all was that he infamously created what came to be called the dead line. Oh. Now, this was an imaginary line within the inner walls of the camp. And guards in the towers were ordered to shoot and kill any prisoner who strayed past that line. And this was carried out, you know, often unreasonably. Brr, how horrible. Good that he was arrested. How much time did he serve? You know, how long was his sentence? How long was his sentence? Very short. Only a main clause and no subordinate clauses. <laughs> he was hanged in 1865. <laughs> Oh, no. I guess they did not give him enough rope. <laughs> Groan. Boo. <laughs> anyway, in time, the tales of Wurtz's deadline got around the country and the word came into popular usage, although in a less severe sentence. <laughs> okay, you're on a roll with the puns. So tell me. Is it known how deadline came to mean a time limit? Sort of. Yes and no. But, but by inference, definitely. Now, it was not until the early 20th century, 1920, in fact, that the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, first cited the word deadline. It was in the uh, title of a play about the newspaper business, of course. And the play was titled Deadline at 11. <laughs> and in the printing presses of the time, early 20th century... A deadline was a line that was marked on the cylindrical press. So any text that fell outside this line would not be legible. It wouldn't be printed. It was like a, like a page margin. So in time, I can only guess that meeting the deadline somehow came to mean that you got your copy to the press in time. You see? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But was that the only reference? There have been quite a few. And... Even by the early 1900s, the word was being used to describe any line that shouldn't be crossed. In a 1909 short story titled The Enchanted Profile, O. Henry used it in the context of uh, social propriety. Uh, here, here's the quote. She had unfailing kindliness and good nature, and not even a white-led drummer or fur importer had ever dared to cross the dead line of good behavior in her presence. Nice. Oh, Henry used it. Several others did, and there have been many uh, references to it. But right now I have another deadline to meet. We are in the business after all. And that, ladies, gents, and others, is another fascinating episode of What's That Word? Bye. And that is our show. Thank you so much for being here and for listening. I'd like to thank my guest, Barkadat, and my co-host, Pranati, P with an A, Mother. Now, before you go, remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done this, so you'll never miss an episode of The Literary City. Now, see you again next Wednesday, and have a great week.